what we have here is a classic demonstration of the type that Michael Faraday himself probably used. You have two coils, one coil that's connected to a deflection galvanometer, the large meter back there, and another coil that's connected to the power supply. Now for almost six years, Michael Faraday had a hunch that somehow this coil would speak to the other coil. But he was unable to make it happen until one day it is said that his assistant was playing around with this current switch and he was turning it on and off. And that's when Faraday noticed this very small deflection. And then he realized that that was the key. You need the current to be changing in this coil, not just a static DC current, but a time varying current. Subsequently, Faraday made several experiments, such as taking the coils really close by, and then you play the same game. You notice the deflection is much larger in this case. And it responds to the change, so it doesn't actually refer to the, if you look at this reading, it's zero right now. I can take it up all the way to max, and then it comes back to zero. If it's not changing, it comes back to zero. And then all the way to zero, it again changes. So it's the change it responds to, not the actual magnitude of the current, but the rate of change. Uh, subsequent experiments were done using other things like magnets. So let me just replace the power supply here and use instead of the power supply magnets. So what I'm going to do is, let's forget about the other coil. Let's just think about one coil. What happens when I put a, simply put a magnet to this coil? So here's a coil and here's a really powerful, I would say it's almost a five Tesla magnet. It's coated with plastic to make it safe. So what I'll do is I'll move it through the coil. You can see that even as I'm trying to move it outside, it's changing its uh, the galvanometer deflection a little bit. But if I move it inside, of course the deflection is massive and it depends on how quickly I come in or come out, pull out. And if I pull out slowly, of course the deflection is smaller because the rate of change of magnetic flux through the coils uh, through each turn of the coil is going to be smaller. And also it depends on the angle at which I bring it. If I bring it at a steep angle, it's not going to be as much as if I bring it at a direct angle like that. Now will this coil talk to a different coil um, if I do the same trick? Absolutely. It doesn't matter what's causing this change in flux, whether it's a magnet or it's a power supply. You see that if I move this magnet, has the same effect as the power supply, although not as much. The other thing you'll notice is that if you keep the mouths at 90 degrees to each other, the cross talk will, will be greatly reduced, and that's one of the principles used in loudspeaker crossover networks. Inductors are always kept in quality cross crossovers perpendicular to each other to minimize cross talk. Here's a student-friendly version of the same thing that Faraday used consists of a coil attached to a micro ammeter. I'll do the same thing. I'll take this really powerful 7 Tesla magnet and bring it towards a coil in different ways. So I'll bring it first straight in or straight out. You can see the tremendous deflection here. Now I'll try to do it slowly. The deflection is barely there because the rate of change of magnetic flux through the coil is really small. And it also depends on the angle. So if I come in and out at a steep angle, it's different than if I come in and out directly. The difference is not very obvious here because the magnetic field is just too large. The object you see before you, I've darkened the room a little bit, so you cannot clearly see this object. I'll show it to you later in brighter light. It is a generator. So right now, I have unscrewed the bulb. I noticed two things at once. One is of course the bulb doesn't light up and it's really easy for me to turn the crank. Now I'm going to screw in the bulb. And of course you can just by listening to the sound see that I'm having to struggle. The mechanical work that I put into the system is being converted into ohmic power in the form of I squared R. So the 
thought, the work done by the torque of my cranking is being completely converted into electricity and of course some frictional heat of the generator itself. Let's examine the generator in full daylight. Um, you can see that it's got basically a coil of many turns and it's turning in the magnetic field of a powerful horseshoe system of magnets and when you have this coil turning in a magnetic field it's going to produce an EMF according to the equation of Faraday's law the EMF equals NBA times sine of omega T times the omega itself which is the angular frequency of cranking this little thing here is responsible for all the electricity that we use in our daily lives of course far bigger versions of it are, are under waterfalls and other places and when water hits the paddle that's when the generators move and they produce electricity that's then sold to you uh, through companies. In this context there is an interesting story when King George, I forget which George it is, um, visited Michael Faraday's lab and Michael Faraday had become world famous for having invented the generator at that time and also uh, discovering Faraday's law. Um, King George asked him, well that's pretty cute and nice, uh, however what use is it? And Michael Faraday is said to have replied to the king, well I don't know about use sir, but one day you shall tax people for it. And how right he is, we are still being taxed by electric companies. The negative sign in front of Faraday's law which is EMF equals negative rate of change of magnetic flux through an open surface. That negative sign is called Lenz's law. Lenz's law is very important and it shows up in all kinds of situations. Here it shows up in the concept of magnetic braking using eddy currents. I will first swing the pendulum a few times without anything underneath it so that you can see how the natural frequency of the pendulum dies down for about 10 oscillations. I will next repeat the same experiment, but this time keeping a heavy, a massive copper block below. You can see that it does not even make a single oscillation. The damping is so strong through the magnetic eddy currents that it stops instantly. Let's see it again. And you can see how the stand shakes through the reaction force and now this powerful neodymium magnet simply drifts over the copper surface aimlessly. Let's try the same thing with a laminated aluminum square. Well, the breaking is still happening, although not as intensely. Let's try it with a aluminum disc next. It's pretty strong, just one or two oscillations. Let's finally try it with a humble piece of aluminum, not very thick. Well, there is a small degree of damping, especially visible now. You can see that the aluminum is making it dance in a funny way. So there is eddy currents there too. In the next segment of this video, I would like to show you another example of eddy current, which is obtained by dropping various magnets through different kinds of pipe. First I have
what might not even be a magnet. So let's try to drop it through this pipe. You see, it does not take much time to drop through. And that shows that it's not truly magnetic, it's just a piece of aluminum. It takes as long to drop if I simply drop it outside as if I chose to drop it inside. But what about this one? It takes a really long time, so that must be a magnet. I'm almost afraid to try it with our powerful seven Tesla magnet. takes a longer time, but not by much. Now let's try the same thing with copper. Copper, as you know, is a much better conductor than aluminum. So I'll try this with the same 7 Tesla magnet. It takes a longer time. Here's another one. Let's try it first with what appears to be a pretty heavy metal. Whoops, looks like it was not magnetic after all. Now let's try it with this, what I think is a really powerful magnet. to have lost it. There it is. 